Good evening and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960 AM News Talk Radio every Monday through Friday at six o'clock. I bring you interesting interviews with businesses and politicians and other people that are dealing lately with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And uh, I now um, have the pleasure of introducing you to George Irwin, who is the CEO of Irwin Toys. Uh, he calls himself a toy coon and a mask ranger, which I think is spectacular. And uh, both, I think it's going to be interesting to chat with him about what he's been doing with his company, but also he's been retooling his company to produce masks. So, uh, Mr. Irwin, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Not at all. Thank you very much. And uh, nice to be nice and warm in this crazy weather we seem to be having in this crazy world. Well, it's nice and sunny today outside my windows, but it was snowing this morning, so it is a little bit crazy. Yeah, same here. So, uh, sir, um, CEO of Irwin Toys, that must be uh, quite an interesting job. Uh, it is. It's a, it's a family company. Uh, it's been around for uh, 94 years, uh, started by my grandfather, so I'm a third generation, and uh, we have a fourth generation. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been a great business to be in. I mean, it, uh, uh, it's been all over the map. Irwin Toy was at one point the largest uh, toy company in Canada and, and, and has gone through ups and downs over its 94-year history, but we're still making toys and we're still selling products to kids uh, worldwide. And, and uh, it's been um, an interesting uh, 10 years, you know, since uh, Apple phones and iPads and all of the electronics that kids seem to get involved with uh, has had an impact on the toy business. But uh, Irwin Toy makes products designed for kids, traditional toys, games, uh, dolls. Uh, we have avoided going too deeply into the uh, electronic business um, just because there are people who do it better than we do and we want to concentrate on, you know, the fun toys that kids take to parties or take on trips or play in their bedrooms. So. Right. And, and from what I understand, you're now involved in uh, manufacturing masks, is that correct? Yeah, so what happened, and it was very, very funny how this all happened. Uh, the beginning of, of uh, April, um, we got an email from uh, a guy that we've known for over 20 years who's made toys for us and various different uh, types of product. And he converted one of his factories into making masks late last year. And, uh, and so he ended up, as I say, he won the lottery um, and I wish he'd bought me a ticket because uh, he's been doing nothing but make masks. And so uh, he handled uh, masks for people in China as well as supplying the Hong Kong government with more than a million masks a day when COVID-19 was, was very, very uh, strong in that part of the world. And this email arrived in my inbox uh, and I looked at it and he said, you know, we're making masks, George, do you have any need for masks in Ontario or in North America? And I said, well, you never know. So I picked up the phone and I, we know the people in the Collingwood Hospital, my wife and I, who, uh, and which is where we live. And I called the CEO of the hospital. And I said, look, I've got a connection for masks. Do you need any? And she said, absolutely. We can use 40,000 masks. 40,000. I said, okay. And she One said, hospital. Okay. this is the Collingwood General Marine Hospital. And so I said, uh, or she said to me, are you okay if I give you the names of some other hospitals in the area? And I said, sure. By the end of the day, we'd sold 350,000. By the end of uh, the week, we'd sold a half a million. And now we're over a million and on, on our way to our second million. So uh, it just exploded. And um, I'm, I'm sorry to say we've kind of put the toy business on a side while we look to see if we can um, help the frontline workers who are dealing with this horrendous virus and uh, get the masks as they need them. Desperate. Now, are you able to retool, retool your plants to start producing it, or is this something you're importing, or, or how are you meeting the demand? So this is a factory that uh, did get retooled. We, we don't own any factories in, in, in uh, Asia. We only use other people's uh, factories, but it's our product. In this particular case, he's got his own factory. He had retooled, and he had started making the product, and that's how we got involved. We have subsequently uh, found other um, factories in China making uh, N90 or KN95 masks, face the face shields, gowns, etc. So we've really gone from the three ply um, surgical mask that everybody you know sort of wears over the year 
to making uh, four or five different items and supplying them to hospitals and uh, uh, medical um, places right across North America and the Caribbean. We're getting phone calls all over, from all over the country. And so you're the distribution point for this uh, Chinese company effectively. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we've become, we've become a very significant d distribution of masks to uh, the Ontario government, uh, to hospitals in Ontario and in the, in the U.S. Uh, we're shipping to the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos. Um, we had an inquiry from Ireland uh, just the other day because they can't get masks. And, you know, the, the, the neat thing is we've taken our toy people who are used to being in the plants inspecting the toys as we made toys and we put them on making and uh, doing inspections in plants where we're having our masks made. Right. So, you know, we, we've kind of used the toy uh, model uh, because, you know, you want to make the best toys possible. You never want to injure anybody. And, and, and so we've used those same um, regulations and same principles, processes into the mask business. So we're getting good quality masks at reasonable prices. And uh, the good news is we're getting them out of, uh, out of China on a timely basis. I won't say as, as quickly as we always would want, but um, we're, we're getting over the hurdles as they come up. Well, I'd like to uh, turn uh, to supply chain uh, issues in our next segment, but we're going to take a break for traffic and messages. And thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Irwin for, uh, of Irwin Toys, the, uh, the toy coon, uh, for joining us tonight. Everyone take a break, and we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960 AM. We're chatting with... Uh, uh, the CEO of Irwin Toys, the toy coon, uh, George Irwin, who uh, is um, producing masks instead of toys today. And we just talked about uh, how uh, he's uh, getting the supply from, uh, from a former toy manufacturer, uh, toy supplier in China. And he's using his, uh, his, his superstructure, his uh, management structure that uh, used to uh, test toys to be testing these masks. Um, Mr. Irwin, um, Supply chain must be an issue. You know, we just heard a story of two uh, cargo jets coming back from China empty because they couldn't bring back uh, the supplies. What's your concerns about supply and how are you dealing with it? Well, I think I, think I share uh, everyone's feeling that it's a shame that two planes went over there and couldn't load up with masks and get them back to the people who need them. I mean, how it happened, why it happened and all of that, I'm sure will come out at some point in time. But um, you know, what, what we're doing, and, and I think one of the things that, that makes what we're doing work is we have our own people in China who are dealing with the factories, dealing with the freight forwarders, dealing with the, uh, the, the, the inspection protocol. Uh, we even went ahead and, and hired a uh, former um, uh, government inspector in the medical field to be a consultant to us to help us get through some of the new you know, regulations that the Chinese government put up just in the last week, which has delayed product from going through um, inspection process and getting on these aircraft. And, and you know, I mean, it's, um, look, the Chinese are very, very proud people and, and they make a tremendous product for the most part. Uh, but when they get criticized, um, you know, they, they feel like they're losing face. And, and unfortunately, uh, our neighbors to the south have, have perhaps criticized them far too much. And uh, as a result of that, uh, they've got their backs up and they're putting up all kinds of roadblocks to uh, delay the, the, the um, product getting to where it needs to go. And, and unfortunately, Canada, to a lesser extent than the US, is affected by this. And uh, I, mean, I can tell you um, that product is having a very difficult time getting into the United States as a result of the, some of the criticism that comes out of the U.S. government. And um, we are getting delays, but as I said before, it's not something we can't uh, overcome, and we do, but it's taking its, it's toll. Um, How long uh, does it take to come to uh, Canada, and when it comes here, or do you have to warehouse it in some sort of quarantine warehouse before you can distribute it? No, we, we bring the product in. We, sell, we actually sell the product FOB. Uh, China and our customers uh, take product as soon as it lands at the airport it's right over to their uh, warehouse and out into the hospital so there's no need for quarantine now uh, when it arrives here 
No, I mean, I think our, our government has been really proactive in uh, allowing uh, product to come in without the traditional um, Health Canada testing. Uh, they're recognizing testing that's done in other countries as being equivalent to uh, the testing in, um, in, in North America. And as a result of that, um, we are um, lucky that some of the international tests that our mass have gone under are being accepted by Health Canada. And, uh, and, that's, and that's speeding the process through. I interviewed a gentleman yesterday that's in the business of uh, building shields for healthcare workers and, uh, and, and produced here in, uh, in Canada. And he's of the opinion that global supply chains are going to change dramatically because of what uh, you're speaking to in regards to, you know, uh, issues from the United States, the restrictions on 3M shipping masks across the border, uh, et cetera. And he thinks that we're going to go to a model, if not long-term, certainly for short-term, where a lot more things are produced uh, in the national uh, environment rather than uh, the global distribution chains that we've been used to in the past. Do you have a thought about that? Yeah, I think he's absolutely right. Uh, I, I agree. And in fact, you know, we're doing, um, taking steps to, uh, to make that happen as well. Uh, look, global supply chain only works when um, it isn't needed in a hurry, in a rush, and uh, there isn't something like a pandemic that's going on. Um, but when that happens, all bets are off, and then whoever's making the product takes the first the first uh, dibs on the inventory, and and uh, you know the rest of us are left sort of scrambling, and and that's what's happened. And I agree. I think that um, a new way of doing business is coming out of this, and many different things. Uh, I mean, I think just think about retail stores and whatnot. Now that everybody's buying online, uh, think about all the people that are working from home. And the office buildings, do you need as many square feet for office space when you can set people up in their homes and, the, and business seems to be going on? So there's a whole lot of things that are, you know, we're going to have to rethink. And supply chain is one of them and global manufacturing is another. So are you thinking about uh, potentially starting to produce these masks in Canada? Uh, we're looking at it. Uh, we, we are uh, anxious to uh, find um, you know, maybe a new and innovative mask that uh, might be uh, uh, worthwhile looking at manufacturing. Certainly the Ontario government is anxious to have some local manufacturing uh, of masks done here, but that presents issues too, because when the, uh, when the, the pandemic is over and we return to a sort of a normal supply chain model, um, hospitals are gonna buy masks at the lowest cost they can get and if you're making in Ontario it's a lot more expensive than making um, in Asia so how does the how does the you know the local manufacturing stay in business get enough business to stay in business when everybody looking is looking for the low cost producer so that's a model that has to be looked at from a government point of view maybe they have there's got to be some sort of ongoing procurement from the, the federal or provincial government that uh, is enough to justify local manufacturing if uh, if uh, global manufacturing is going to go away in a, in a time of pandemic again but let me ask you about sort of the the going back to work and reopening um you know, i've spoken to a couple of people who think that you know you're not going to be selling masks to just hospitals you're going to be selling masks to everybody that, uh, you know, I, I, a friend of mine posted on Facebook today a picture of her on a GO train. GO train was com completely empty and there were other than two people and both those people had masks on. So, you know, when we reopen and we start using transit and elevators and offices, is there a market for absolutely everyone, not just hospitals, for your masks? Absolutely. I, I think the market is, is even bigger than it is right now. And, and I think that um, whatever government, local, provincial, federal, um, decides to open up uh, major cities uh, back to whatever the new normal is, part of that I think is going to be you have to wear a mask. And, and that's a real cultural shift for most of us in North America. The Asian, Asian markets have been wearing masks for, for years. When they get a sniffle, they put a mask on. I mean, they're very concerned about that. We don't seem to be. I mean, we're sneezing and coughing all over the place and really we don't care. But now we have to think about that and we have to really make some changes. And I think having masks 
available as you walk walk out the door is going to be like picking an umbrella when it's raining. Are we going to start putting logos and uh, fashion on masks? Absolutely. No question about it. And, and what are you designing on them now? Well, I can't say right now, but uh, <laughs> I may have some of my competitors listening. But uh, it's going to happen. There's no question about it. Uh, what about uh, other than just uh, masks? Are you thinking about shields? Are you thinking about gowns? Are you thinking about uh, any other kind of protective equipment? Um, I, I think we, we're not going to get into the, uh, into the shield business. I think there's enough people that are, uh, are doing that. And I, and I applaud, um, you know, Bauer and CCM and those guys converting their hockey shields into uh, COVID-19 masks for the hospitals. I think that's a marvelous thing that they're doing. And um, so, uh, but we're looking at other things besides masks. And uh, I mean, I think that um, uh, gowns would be another one, um, maybe two or three different versions of masks. And, uh, and then we'll take it from there. I, I mean, you know, even, even the, the distilleries are, are starting to make hand sanitizer. And I, and I think that's just fantastic what people are stepping up to do to help us get through this because, you know, that just shows the ingenuity of Canadians. What about gloves? Any opportunity for gloves? I, 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 don't, think, I don't think for us, no. I mean, um, uh, you know, you can't do everything. I think you just you want to pick your spot and, uh, and we're comfortable with where we are. Now, for you, it wasn't a big issue because you had a supplier in China that was uh, producing it. But uh, for um, you know CCM, for uh, for Bauer, for this uh, other company that I mentioned that was doing shields, retooling uh, a whole plant to start producing a brand new product uh, during this this time period, and not knowing, as you uh, correctly point out, whether that market's going to be there in the long term or not, that's a big issue. Um, even in your own case, changing your supply chains have got to be a, a big issue. How do you deal with all that? Well, the good, thing, the good thing is that in our particular case, the factory had already been up making masks for the Asian market for China and, uh, and Hong Kong. And so um, really what we had to concentrate on is uh, getting the right inspectors into the, into the factories and monitoring the production and understanding where all things you know, could go wrong. And, and the other part of that is uh, getting ourselves familiar with the, the inspection protocols and the testing protocols. You know, in the case of some, some of these guys that are retooling their factory to make face shields and whatnot, um, you know, it, it's a similar product. It, yes, it does take a different mold, but they're, they're already there. They don't have to go out and get the machinery, so, so to speak. They already have it, and so it's a question of converting them as quickly as possible. And, and uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's terrific they're doing it. What's going to happen to the toy business? Uh, are we going to be less interested in uh, playing with toys that anyone else has touched? Are we going to be buying more in a more sanitary uh, manner? Um, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, and and I, I, I think I say this for most consumer products. Part of the problem is you've got three or maybe four months before we get back opening up um, our, our, our stores, our retail stores, where inventory hasn't moved. It's been sitting there. It's all been, you know, people expected to sell product through February, March, April, maybe even as into May and June. And now all of a sudden we're open. And so all that product that should have been sold is still on the market, is still on the, on the shelves. And so in the, in the case of the toy business, um, I think it's going to affect a, uh, a very thin Christmas, if you will, in terms of new product. I think that innovation and uh, um, uh, new product hitting the market is going to be a lot less than it has been in, in the past few years, and people are going to be clearing out inventory that is old and hasn't been sold. And I think that probably speaks to a lot of, uh, um, you know, look, think of the of the winter wear that, you know, we were in the middle of, and now by the time the store's open, we're into summer or halfway through summer. I mean, there's a whole major in, uh, retail in various different ways that we haven't had to think about in, over the last many years. Yeah, I just really wonder if people are gonna go into stores and maybe you know, the toy business is different because most of it comes all packaged up, but uh, are people gonna wanna put on uh, suits and clothes and? Uh, and shirts that someone else may have had on. Are you going to want to go into a uh, into a facility where 
germs are, uh, are, are prevalent? Um, or are you going to be in a far more um, socially distant, uh, physically distant uh, environment and where, uh, you know, no one's touched my makeup or my clothes or my toys or my computer before I touch it? Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of that. I think that, uh, you know, we're going to have to be thinking about what constitutes meet and greet in the new fu- in the in the near future and, and 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 you know i know in the case of most of us we've gone through a, a period of where you greet everybody with a hug and and um i don't think that's going to be the same anymore and you may just be uh you know you may just go back to the way the japanese and the asians are doing standing back and bowing a couple of times and that's your hello and, and that's your goodbye um it, you know all bets are off well, I remember where I used to go to the LCBO. There was a wicket, and you had to go up to the wicket and fill in a little a form, and then someone went and got your alcohol and brought it to you, and it was a very sort of a behind the the counter um, process. And it's is that what it's going to go back to? You know, I went to uh, to a local uh, home improvement warehouse uh, this weekend, bought a bunch of uh, chemicals for my pool and grass seed. It was frankly excellent. I ordered it online in the morning. I went there in the afternoon, and they packed it all up in my trunk. It was actually far more convenient it was a more pleasurable experience yeah and i and i think there's a lot of that happening in other industries as well i mean our local uh, grocer uh will um pack it up and bring it out to your car when you drive up or in fact in collingwood where we live we live they'll deliver it to the house no charge and and uh you know all of the restaurants or major restaurants in the city or town are doing um you know takeout only or uh, delivery um, so, you know, we're getting used to, um, different ways of, of interacting with people. We have, my wife and I have a standard Friday night cocktail party with friends of ours who normally we'd be sitting out in the backyard, um, you know, in the nice weather. Well, now it's over Zoom or Skype or one of the other, uh, um, video chat, um, platforms. And, um, that's what we have to do to have any interaction. So. That's new. It's going to be an interesting world. Well, we're going to take a break for traffic and messages and come back uh, with George Irwin and Irwin, the CEO of Irwin Tours. Um, in just a minute, uh, stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. We're here with George Irwin, the CEO of Irwin Toys. He calls himself a toy coon, which I think is kind of fun. Um, and uh, we've just had a really good uh, conversation about how he has sourced masks uh, from uh, a previous toy manufacturer that retooled to produce masks in China. He's using his own or in toy inspectors to inspect them and he's selling them to numerous different hospitals in the province of Ontario, et cetera. Um, and a bunch of other businesses and what they're going to change. But uh, Mr. Irwin, I wonder if we could elevate for a second and uh, could you think about um, what, what it is sort of in management and leadership uh, during a emergency like this pandemic? Uh, because it seems like you've really sort of, taken a bad situation and made it into an opportunity and created a business out of it uh, that wouldn't have been there. And I can imagine, um, you know, the alternative would have been layoffs and, and, and other things for some of your people. Um, in an economic downturn, whether it's caused by a pandemic or an emergency or a financial collapse, a lot of people will just hunker down, lay people off and wait it out and hope things improve in the future. But some people like yourself have taken an opportunity to create new businesses. What's the difference in management and leadership? of companies that take advantage of that opportunity versus just hunker down and wait it out? Well, I think there are a lot of things that go into it. First of all, um, you know, I consider myself an entrepreneur and, and as being so uh, willing to take risks, obviously, and move on opportunities as they arise as quickly as possible. And, and so um, out of an email has come a, uh, a huge opportunity for us that, had I not picked up the phone and called one hospital here in Collingwood that led to a bunch of others, uh, we'd be sitting here trying to figure out whether it's time to play checkers or Scrabble. And um, so, you know, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is understanding um, your business's ability to be uh, nimble and to uh, retool uh, willingness to be that way. You know, there are, are multinational companies that probably looked at the opportunity and said, you know what, it, it just doesn't, isn't us. Um, 
and we wouldn't even know, uh, you know, we know what our core is and this is not our core business and we'll wait it out. And that's fine, that, that's, that's what they do. In our particular case, uh, we, we decided we wanted to help people. Um, we decided that we wanted to find out how quickly we could get the masks from China to Canada and places around here to be able to help the people in the front lines. And so we jumped in with both feet and we motivated our, our people to uh, get their heads around. Now it's a, a different product, but the same processes are, are in place and we'll be, uh, we'll be doing the same things except instead of a toy, it's a mask. And, and I think that there are a lot of people, we just talked about an example of, of retooling uh, face shields and whatnot. So I, I think it, it's the ability of some companies to jump on the opportunity, be nimble, and, uh, and take that entrepreneurial risk. Because there's risk, there's always risk. Um, during the economic decline in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, did you have a similar kind of adaptive strategy or what, what was the case there? Well, we had, uh, it, it, that, that particular downturn hurt our industry significantly and, uh, and hurt our company as, uh, as well. And, and we frankly scaled ourselves back and, and went to uh, uh, fewer brands and, and then started to build it up again from there. And um, it wasn't a question of so much retooling, it was really a question of, of um, making your core brands that much stronger over that period of time. So when you came out of it, you had um, some evergreens that would allow you to um, sell product different parts of the world on a continuous basis and not come up with everything new every year, which the toy business is mostly new. Yeah. But it's interesting because the way you've described it, it was a, it was a chance encounter uh, with a manufacturer that you had a previous relationship with that called you up and asked if you wanted to, uh, to buy slash sell some masks. And then it sounds like you had a chance um, uh, association with the Collingwood Hospital because you were involved in it, so you knew somebody. Um, and then uh, that person put you in touch with a bunch of other hospitals. So there's a bunch of networking or chance connections that you took advantage of. Um, and... Um, and maybe it's that entrepreneurial spirit that you said you started with and or this desire to help. You weren't sure whether you're going to make a good profit out of it, but it was maybe first a desire to see if there was a need and help that, uh, that was the driving force. Is any of that correct? Well, I think a lot of it's correct. Uh, I mean, I think the fact that I did know somebody at the hospital uh, was made it easier to get through. Um, had I not known somebody, I still would have made the phone call. Yeah. And, and uh, it may not have gotten as through as quickly and may not have ended up with the the order as quickly as we did. I think at the end of the day, we'd still be where we are, but it may have taken us a little longer. Uh, I, th I think the nice thing about what happened is uh, we started with one person and, and really it was one person recommending us to another person who recommended us to three people. And, and then, um, and then the word started to spread. And, and uh, I mean, I'm, amazed every day the phone rings there'd be somebody who said oh i saw your this or i heard about that or i googled masks in canada and Irwin toys popped up as being a provider and and i went, wow okay you know so luck's involved i mean and i think if any entrepreneur tells you that there's no luck in entrepreneurship they're not telling you the truth but it's but it's, it's luck it's as you said uh, jumping in with two feet it's um, it's the connections that you had with all these different uh, people, and it's uh, you know you're, you you said that you were willing to take a risk, and big multinationals may not be willing to take a risk, and you were nimble and able to take a risk. Yeah, and, and I think and I think you know, um, risk r risk is is something that that um, everybody deals with every day, whether they realize it or not, and certainly. Um, multinational companies, big companies, small companies, they all have their appetite for risk. And um, I think entrepreneurs are willing to put things at risk more than maybe the big, uh, big Fortune 500 companies. I'm sure that they took risks on the way up. And when they got there, their risk appetite maybe had got a little less 
uh, uh, whereas smaller, nimble companies, in order for them to get ahead, they have to take risk. I mean, that's just so, part of it. I had a, a money manager on my show, and, uh, and he was interesting because what he said was that some of the greatest fortunes in history were developed by people that invested in brand new businesses in economic downturns or, or terrible times. And, uh, and he said, you know, Darwin said it wasn't the biggest or the strongest that uh, survive. It's the, one that, uh, the ones that can adapt that uh, survive. Um, and uh, he said, just watch. There are going to be some companies that hunker down and just wait this out. And then there's going to be others that take advantage of this situation, you know, see it as a new normal and uh, figure out how to reinvent their business to be profitable, make money. And as you said, uh, you know, satisfy a need. If I was going to put you up on stage in front of a hundred business people and ask you to inspire them to not just hunker down, but take advantage of the opportunity, what would you say to them? Well, I guess maybe the first thing I would say is, um, do you have the, the fortitude to um, do something like we're doing? And, and I mean by that, um, you know, there's some people who just are, take it easy, take it slow, um, and, and, we'll, and everything will be fine in the end. And then there are others, and I consider myself one, where we're looking at where we can go next and how we can get there and what is the next you know big thing now um like you um i truly believe that uh the mask business is here to stay forever i don't think it's going to go away and i think uh that is going to be one of the new normals and so when we decided to make that first phone call it was with the idea that we were getting into this not just for a couple of days, but we're getting into it to make a real difference. And that's what we're trying to do. And everybody at Irwin is 100% making a difference. And they, and, and they, you know, they, they like that. They want to be part of that. So to come back to your, you know, your question is, you know, do you have the appetite to do what's necessary to make a success out of it? And, uh, you know, in, just to give you an example, um, I'm up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm talking to the Asia before they shut down for the day. And then we have our full day here, um, talking to people who we sold masks to, getting new orders, answering questions, et cetera. Uh, and then I'm back on the phone to Asia till about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And then I'll watch the news and then I'm up at four and, and that's my new normal right now. And that's probably the way it's going to be. There are lots of people who wouldn't do that. Yeah. You know, and, and they don't, they want, they want no part of it. And uh, that's not, that's not us. And that's not, and that's why I think we've been as successful as we have. Well, it's so, a great inspirational story. Number one, uh, you're supplying a need because uh, we're probably all going to be fairly soon wearing, if not an Irwin toy mask, uh, um, a, a mask very comparable to that. And, uh, and number two, um, hopefully you're making good profit out of it. Well, I think the, f the first thing is, yes, are we making money? Yes, we are. Um, but more importantly, we're giving the people on the front lines who get all of my uh, respect that they put their lives there for the betterment of other people. And we just want to get them stuff as much as we can, fast as we can. And, you know, they're the heroes. Uh, they really are. And if someone wants to buy some masks, is there an Irwin Toy website they can go to? Yeah www.erwintoy.com and uh, we're happy to look after people. Um, you know, this is, uh, this, is our, um, this is our business right now and we'll get back to the toy business in a couple of months, but we're, we're here to do this. Well, George Irwin, uh, CEO of Irwin Toys and uh, Toy Coon, thank you very much for joining us today on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Brian. It was a great pleasure to, to meet you and, and be part of your show. Thank you. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960 AM. I'm, uh, I'm here every night, 6 o'clock, Monday through Friday on 960 AM, or you can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca and or you can get all of my podcasts and video casts. They're available on briancrombie.com podcasts or briancrombie.com backsplash uh, videos. Um, you know, I think this issue is probably one of the most important issues that we've got to be facing today after, obviously, number one, the healthcare crisis, 
and number two, the, uh, the economic crisis. Um, but it is that this is a change to, uh, to our business um, economy, business community. Uh, and, and I think there's sort of two different strategies. Um, and, um, and one strategy is to just hunker down, lay people off, furlough people, um, and wait it out and hope you can withstand the, uh, the, the dip that we're in and, and, and relaunch in a couple of months. And, uh, and then the other strategy is no, to, uh, to take advantage of the situation and reinvent yourself somehow, whether it's uh, restaurants that are providing takeout or whether it's home improvement where, uh, warehouses that are doing online ordering and, uh, and curb delivery, uh, curb pickup, or whether it's companies like Irwin Toys that are taking their prior uh, um, toy manufacturers uh, that have uh, changed to a mask manufacturer and start buying the masks and selling the masks uh, across, uh, across the country and, and further. Um, or like uh, Spartan Bioscience that I interviewed that actually took their handheld DNA testing that was uh, um, created for DNA for other disease states and all of a sudden really quickly retooling it uh, to do a DNA test for COVID-19. Or, um, or D squared uh, medical devices that are taking a plastic injection molding company and an automotive company and all of a sudden building shields for, uh, for our uh, frontline uh, workers that we can wear. Um, or it's Amazon that clearly uh, can take advantage of uh, the delivery that they've already got. Um, but I do think that, that, uh, that uh, this COVID-19 is not going to go away and its impact is not going to go away right away. Um, you know, during the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, 1919, we all know these numbers. Uh, we've heard about it. There was a second and a third wave. And the second and third wave were more deadly than the first wave. And what caused it, uh, you know, and we didn't have a world then that we have today of, uh, of communication uh, globally, but um, there was a lot of political pressure, a lot of business pressure to reopen, you know, surprise, surprise, we've seen that every day on CNN and Fox and News and, and even in uh, Canadian news. Um, and people opened up um, and they weren't, they weren't prepared, they weren't ready, they weren't socially distancing, they weren't physically distancing, and a second wave came and more people got infected and more people died. Um, and so, I fear it's gonna happen again. And I think that what we gotta do is we've gotta be prepared for this new normal and it's gonna continue for a while. We can't just believe we're all gonna go back to the exact way the world was in January and June. Um, it's gonna be different somehow, whether it's that we're all wearing masks or whether we're all standing six feet apart or whether it's that uh, office space downtown is not nearly as attractive as it once was or condos aren't as attractive as they once were. People wanna live in, uh, in single family dwellings again, and people are resistant to taking transit. I'm not sure exactly what those changes are, but I think there's gonna be changes. But more importantly than figuring out what those changes are, it's being adaptive in your own business or your own industry or your own life to thinking through what the opportunities might be. And uh, you know, I think I've mentioned this to you before, I was really challenged and, and, and interested in 2009, uh, 2010 during the economic uh, collapse of the Great Recession about companies that took advantage of the situation versus companies that didn't take advantage of the situation and were harmed by it and devastated by it. And as I mentioned, uh, I had a money manager on my show that told me that the biggest wealth um, um, in the in the past was created by people that that uh, that took advantage and built new businesses during economic downturns and his point was a lot of people forget is that when you buy at the bottom you can make a lot of money and when you sell at the top you can make a lot of money and most people do the opposite when everyone is selling and it's a bottom they get scared and they sell too and when everyone is buying even though it may be a top people keep buying People want to do what everyone else is doing, and that only makes the, the top higher and the, and the bottom lower. And being a contrarian and actually you know, believing there's going to be a future and investing or buying when you're at that, uh, that bottom ends up being something that can create a lot of wealth. And, and how do you do that? Well, I think that uh, uh, George Irwin uh, and other people have mentioned a lot of these things, and I talk about it in a talk I do called Community the Power Co. But it's things like being open to entrepreneurship, being open to take risk, having courage. Um, it's collaboration, it's communication, it's connections. It's those people that, that, that George had this connection from China that gave him a call by chance, that he knew someone at the hospital, he called them by chance, they connected up with a bunch of other people. Um, and so, you know, yeah, that's luck, but it's, it's taking advantage of luck. All of us get created with, presented with opportunities day in and day out, but actually taking advantage of those opportunities and doing something with it is something that a lot of us aren't willing to do. 
and, uh, and we rest on our laurels and we don't take advantage of that. So I think that takes a special thing. I think his desire to do something good, to meet a need, make money at the same time out of it clearly, but you want to have this desire to create, uh, to, 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 to satisfy a need that is in the marketplace. And he saw the need for masks and he jumped on it and he called the hospital and they said, of course, 20,000 units, we'll buy them. And it snowballed from there. And then it's this nimble attitude that I can adapt, I can change. Um, and then his comment about jumping with two feet, that's courage. That's, that's uh, um, you know, going with it. Um, and, and then I think the other thing is being open to coincidences in life. You know, Einstein said coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. And I don't know if I exactly believe that or not, but the idea of, you know, whether it's luck or, or coincidence or whatnot, when opportunity knocks, answer the door and run with it. And so I guess if there's any message that I get from George Irwin and from Spartan Bioscience and from D-Squared Medical Devices and Drone Delivery Canada and some of the other companies that I've been privileged to uh, chat with over the course of the last couple of uh, weeks of this pandemic, it's take advantage of the crappy times, of the bad times. Think about how you can meet a need. Think about how you can help people. And in the end, if you make money out of it, all the better, frankly. But Think about that need, be nimble, change, be entrepreneurial. And, and when opportunity knocks, answer the door, take advantage of it and jump in with two feet, be courageous. And now's not the time to, to not, now's not the time to be socially distant. Now's the time to be physically distant, but not socially distant. Think about what George said. It was a chance call he got from a former supplier in China, a chance relationship he had with, uh, the, the Collingwood Hospital, and then the chance that, that Collingwood Hospital knew a whole bunch of other people. That's connections. That's social networking. That's social capital. That's being close to people socially, even if you're not close to them physically. So bottom line, reach out and touch somebody. Give them a call. Find out how they're doing. Maybe they'll say, I'm doing great, but I need a blah, 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 or I've got this new opportunity, or here's something we can do together. Anyway, be nimble, be quick, because remember what Darwin said, it's not the biggest or the strongest that necessarily survive. It's the one, uh, ones that are most adaptable to change. And then I think another one is, it's not the competition of the species, it's the cooperation of the species that's the key. Species, people, groups that cooperate the best are the ones that are gonna be most successful in life. Anyway, that's my two cents for the night. Good night, thank you. Please join us again, Monday through Friday. Six o'clock on Saga 960 AM or www.saga960am.ca or all my podcasts and websites. All my podcasts and videocasts are available at briancrombie.com backslash either podcasts or videocasts. Good night. Pleasure chatting with you. Be safe.